I'm here at Celsius, the headquarters, Alex Mashinsky, and he's the CEO, and he started about eight different companies, and he has a lot to share. We're going to talk about Celsius. We're going to talk about his previous ventures, like the Wi-Fi in the subway, which I really like it, and also about voice over IP, which he basically worked with. But, and also, but let's first start a little bit with your personal life. So we'll get to that. I'll put it on in little blocks. So, Alex... Um, you started. Uh, you started your life in uh, in the Ukraine, right? Uh, yeah, what, what do you remember of that? Uh, long lines for food, uh, freezing winters. Um, you know, not a lot of toys. <laughs> so, it, as a kid, do you mind? Did you mind that? How? How? What? What time did you leave? Uh, no, I was seven when my parents left. But uh, it was definitely uh, growing up as a kid. You don't. You. You don't know. You. You don't know what you're missing, right? So. So life uh, without an iPad and an iPhone it was still possible, and you know I spent most of my time outside playing. Yeah, and it was an enjoyable time, even though there were all these uh, distractions, which all the parents are trying to avoid that their kids look at screens and basically yes. destroy the mind. Well, yeah. So, and, and Russian parents are not helicopter parents; they don't just hover over you and t take care of everything, which allows you to experiment and try things and and i think part of me kind of having this will to go into the unknown is it comes from that the fact that my parents are not uh, have never been there for me you know they were like let me do whatever i wanted so, yeah. so you took the freedom and used it uh, in an interesting way so why did you leave to uh, tel aviv why did you leave to israel so my my father was a refusenik he was uh, one of those guys that thought that all jews should live in israel a zionist and uh, he was refused exit from Russia. That's why these people were called refused nicks. And so they took away his, his uh, red uh, membership, you know, passport, like from being part of the Communist Party. He, he, got, he lost his job. And, and uh, lucky enough, uh, Armand Hammer and, uh, um, has, have convinced the President of the United States to... Uh, uh, basically exchanged 300,000 metric tons of wheat for 300,000 Jews. So, <laughs> oh my God, yes. those were the deals. <laughs> Pre President Nixon uh, uh, basically agreed to the deal, uh -huh. and Armand Hammer, I think, uh, helped finance that. And Because Russia had a horrible winter, horrible... Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they didn't have any food, right? Because yeah. uh, the harvest was very, very bad. Yeah. And they were starving, and they well, they went for the deal. They exchanged. They did the exchange, and me and my uh, sister and my two parents uh, were allowed to exit Russia. And, and uh, it was funny because we we were. I remember being on the train from um, the Ukraine to Vienna, and uh, as we were crossing the border, the you know the guys at the border come up and they say. If you're going to the United States, get off the train, and if you're going to Israel, stay on the train. And and uh, my mother gets up with, tries to grab me and my sister, and my dad is grabbing up other hands, and oh and there's like this big fight on the train of where are we going? And they were like screaming at each other, and I saw my entire family fall apart in front of me. But uh, you know, when people joke, when people say, well, why why did you come to the United States? I say that. I, uh, I came to repay the four metric tons of wheat that the U.S. paid for me in 1972. So uh, if you put all the interest and all of the, the dollars back then, the dollar... So it's funny because the, the dollar lost 90-something percent of its value since 1970. Compared to what? The Swiss franc? <laughs> no, compared to the value of, the do of, of gold or anything else. Because it went off the gold standard in, in 1971. Yeah which is exactly when we left uh, Russia. So, so it depends if you measure it in wheat. If you measure it in wheat, I'm still paying for that because it's, you know, like in real numbers, the wheat, wheat kept its price, not, but the dollar did not. So, How much metric ton was it for uh, you? Metric ton per person. So uh, that's what the... Because it was 300,000 metric... So a thousand kilo? So what is a kilo? A, a dollar or something like that? So it's a thousand dollar or something like that per person? Yes, something like that, whatever it is. God. Your father won. You went to uh, Israel. My father won. We went to Israel. We land there. And of course, a few months later, 
Yom Kippur, the war uh, starts and, and there's like bombs and people are dying all over and my mother is screaming at my father, what did you do? I told you to go to America, you know, and, you're, uh, and you got us stuck in Israel. So I was, I was in Israel for 16 years. I did the military there. And after the military, I tried university. I, I went for one semester, arg argued with every professor and decided that maybe... What was it, electro or something like that? Electrotechnical? I, I electrical engineering in high school. So I did, I got a degree. While I was in high school, I got also a, a degree from the Open University. But then I went to the Tel Aviv University where I studied economics. You didn't work. Oh, economics. And, and economics, I, the whole concept of economics was, was weird for me because, because um, again, it works for a very small percentage of the population. Uh, and and somehow we all wake up in the morning and do do you know continue with the system, this economic system that only works for one percent of the population. Well, you're used to that when you lived in in Russia and on Ukraine, right? You yes. you lived in big uh, big unequal uh, unequalness, although although it was different there. When when did you get mistrustful of those systems? Was that in Israel? Because You've been treated nicely, right? Or were you discriminated when you were a Russian Jew uh, yeah. there? Hey, when I was in Russia, everybody called me a Jew and told me to leave uh, and go to Israel. And when I went to Israel, everybody called me Russian and said to go back to Russia. You know, that we, you couldn't find your place. So, yeah. but the you know, like we we as humans, right? We went through these evolutions, uh, federalism. We we had kings. We had this. We had that. And then we tried communism, we tried socialism, and we tried capitalism, right? So these are all systems. Each one of them has good parts and bad parts, but none of them are perfect. Mm -hmm. and, and when you live overseas, you're thinking America is this wonderful place where everybody's rich and famous. Oh, yeah. But when you come here, you realize that most people are not rich and they're definitely not famous. Mm -hmm. Many of them are infamous. But... The point is, is that that you know I was lucky enough, like you said. Uh, you are also guilty of that because I saw you giving a presentation in Peking. I think it was on for, in, in China, and you said, "Well, if you land in America, they basically they live on credit. They give you cars, they give you a house, they give you everything. So people outside, and it really, it's not that easy. But I mean, you are also contributing to that image of America that you just can live on credit and be happy uh, ever yeah, after. The point is, you can get credit, right? In most countries around the world, doesn't matter how how hard you work or right. what you create. Right, here in America, if you work and you can show people that you can generate income, that you have a salary, you are generating income, then they're willing to give you credit. In most of the world, even if you work real hard, you're not gonna get the credit. So it, it is the land of opportunities, but the opportunity is only available to maybe 1% of the population. And in, in the When did you get mistrustful about the system? Was that, I mean, first, of course, you had right, in Ukraine. And how, what about, how was it in Israel? Well, Israel is a very difficult system. Everybody's smart. Everybody's, uh, uh, you know, like aggressive. They all want to build businesses. So, like, I started a business in Israel, and, and within a few months, my employees quit and started a competing business. You know, even though my business was bad, they somehow thought that they're going to copy it and it's going to be good for them. You know, so, so it's just, uh, uh, that's not, in the U.S., at least when you hire people, most of them uh, are trying to work with you and make it uh, happen. But in Israel, everybody thinks they're smarter than you, so they all think they can do the same thing you're doing even better. That's what I thought when I started a company in America. I thought that everybody was just really, they came to me, they said, you're an okay guy, but I mean, let us run the business. We're doing it much better. And they started their own business. So, but, but you think Israel, Israel, is, Israel is a lot worse. Yeah, much worse. And, uh, but that's the Dutch accent. That's what, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, didn't act in your favor. But look. The, the but competition you learned in Israel. Yes, I. I Israel is great about giving opportunities. So you're an 18 year old soldier and you know, very quickly you can become a, a commander, you can become an officer and, and really have life and death decisions in your hands at the age of 18, 19 and 20, mm -hmm. uh, which most kids, like most Americans don't get that, right? They don't get that opportunity. And, and when I was there, it wasn't really like, still wasn't the tech center of, that it is today. It wasn't startup nations like, like it is today. I started Kibbutz, yeah, which, yeah, so, which I worked in. Yeah. So, so it was more about just uh, like hardcore, like what I studied was hardcore electronics. How do you build circuits? How do you create listening devices? I was in counterintelligence and, 
Air Force and things like that. So, so for me, it was more like just learning the basics of of uh, of what you know how systems operate and and uh, you know I actually started with, uh, when when I left the, uh, the military. I was in, in, in international trade. I was actually trading commodities, phys physical commodities, deliveries, sugar, urania, uh, urea, fertilizer, and a bunch of other things uh, that that. So I had nothing to do. It had nothing to do with what I'm doing today. Yes. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, why did you leave uh, for America? I actually left to Europe. So I, I was, I, I had a deal that I was working on. I had to fly to uh, Paris and uh, take care of some things. And it was cheaper to get a ticket to the U.S. with a stop in Paris than just to buy a round trip to to Paris. So so I had the stop. I was in Paris already. I had the stop to go to the U.S. And I said, you know what? Instead of wasting the ticket, I'm just going to go there for a few days and hang out and come back to Israel afterwards. And I just never came back. That, that was 30 years ago. You stayed in Paris for a while? Yeah, I lived in Paris for like six months in, in Brussels and in Lisbon. So in, uh, I used to take the trains, the night trains, yeah. the, the couche, you know, like just to exactly. You wake up, you didn't need the hotel room. So all of my dealings in Europe were, uh, you know... It was also commodity trading. Yeah, yes. That was mostly commodity trading and, and other type of uh, products. And when I came to the U.S., I, I decided to... Why did you come to the U.S.? Just, I had that ticket. It wasn't any... Uh, there, there was no grand plan. Uh, but when I came to the U.S., I, I uh, started meeting people and talking to people. And somehow they all listened to my ideas. They were like... Oh, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. Let's yeah. build a company. Well, that's what I also had when I came to America. They they were very enthusiastic. But what me when they turn around, they basically forget about you. But yes. they didn't forget about you. Yes, they they didn't. They are, Americans are very enthusiastic when you present an idea. That's a great idea. You should do something about it. But they don't normally say, "Let's start a company together." No, you 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 have to push for it. Yeah, you you have to like I think I mentioned that that. Every one of my companies I had to pitch at least 200 times. I got 200 no's before, before I got a yes from an investor, right? So like you say, they, they say, oh, amazing idea, but to write a check, you have to really work hard. And, and, and then you have to make the company work. And, and it, it doesn't always work, right? It's uh, not anyone who thinks you can just start a company and it works great. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you find yourself in a lot of dark alleys and you have to go in reverse back and restart or or change direction or figure out what you're doing wrong until you find the right path. But after you do four of them, doesn't it get easier? It never gets easier. It's like children, you know, like when you have your first kid, it's not like your third kid is any easier, right? It's each kid is its own uh, creation. And the same thing with companies. Each company, it's like a, is a puzzle. It's origami. It keeps opening up and, and you rediscovering what it's all about. And the fact that it was doing great six months from now, does, uh, six months ago, doesn't mean anything about where it's going to be six months from now. So it's a very fast-moving world, and especially in the United States, I think the, it's such a dynamic market that uh, you you have to be on your toes all the time. So I happen to be a guy that doesn't have an off switch. I'm always thinking, always creating, always trying better to be better and. So it's the ideal country for you. Okay, so this was part one. He's in America now. Let's talk. Next part is about how he got into this voice of IP thing.